And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five. Now, this is the Saturday panel. The theme of the panel this week is around insights into how athletes can receive help when it comes to addressing life's challenges. You may be good at sport, but that doesn't make you immune to issues that every human being can face. Social media and online abuse, the temptation of addiction. There are a couple of examples. We would like to examine what types of support and advice we can lean upon when our lives are affected by unforeseen or difficult circumstances. Some of this content may be sensitive, so listener discretion is advised. In the studio, we have Matt Hemsworth, media lawyer and director at the B5 Consultancy. Fraser Franks, former footballer with Stevenage and Newport County in England, who also works for B5, and the ex-Scottish underage international and Crystal Palace footballer, Lee Nickel. Matt, Fraser and Lee, you're very welcome to the show. Well, we're delighted to be hosted here in Dublin with you. I know, yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Matt, first of all, why are you here this week? Well, we're, we're off to Wicklow tomorrow. Um, we, we're working with the Rugby Players Island. Um, they do a fantastic rookie camp. Uh, we were here last year uh, and we're back again. We're doing some work with the three groups, actually. The women's 15s, women's 7s and men's 7s. The thing I think we're most delighted about is that the boys are going to be outnumbered, probably for the first time that they've ever experienced that. Um, we're going to be doing some... I mean, they're getting lots of great life skills sessions while they're there, but we, me, Fraser and Lee, are going to be doing some sessions with them. One focusing on social media, and we talk about taking responsibility. So when they pick up their phone, take responsibility, raise the bar of who you are, do everything you can to protect yourself. And then the really sad element, which is particularly where Fraser and Lee will come in, we're going to talk about how you cope with not just abuse, but negativity, abuse, and all these things that will come. And most of these boys and girls are going to play some level of representative um, rugby for Ireland. So therefore, they're up there to be shot at, whether it be Six Nations with the girls' 15s or, you know, Sevens rugby for the boys or the girls. And you've got to be ready for someone popping up over your shoulder and telling you you're not very good or even worse. And, of course, um, that's where, where Lee and Fraser come in because they've experienced that and worse. So, Lee, your story was around the publishing of intimate images of you online without your consent. Perhaps you could tell us what happened to you. Yeah, in 2019, I was a 23-year-old playing for Charlton Athletic. I was semi-professional at the time. And I got a message on Instagram. Sorry, I've told that story wrong. In th- yeah, what? No, sorry, I did start. I'm right. In 2019, I was a semi-professional at Charlton Athletic. And I got a message on Instagram. And it was a link that led me to... Um, remember that I had many videos and images of myself that had been stored in my iPhone since back in 2014. Uh, so they were five years old and, and when I opened that link, it was it was life-changing. The moment that I opened that link, everything changed. And I guess looking back, we're now going on to four years this month. Um, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me, but for two years of that, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me at the same time. And when I say the best thing, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. I would certainly never go through it again. But... It taught me, it taught me what the real world is like, and how important privacy and protection is, and how important it is to to always question yourself. Like, what if, what if this got out? What if someone found my phone after the night out? What if someone got into my cloud? What if I shared these with a partner? And in ten years' time, he or she shares that, and um, forwards that on. And I've learned so many key life skills that I wish I didn't have to learn, but I'm grateful for what I have. I've picked up. So your privacy was stolen by somebody completely anonymous? Yeah, my iCloud was hacked. We believe that it was through um, an email address that I was in a, pre- a, a previous article online and that email address was the one that was linked to my old iCloud account and that iCloud account didn't have two-factor authentication, it didn't have the right privacy settings and no longer had access to it. Um, it'd been there for many, many years and the, the individual who'd done it, he or she has never been found and, and I don't think that they ever will. And I think the, the tough thing about that is I've never had anyone else to blame. Um, but I guess the good thing about that is I've never had anyone else to blame other than myself. So the anger is directed straight back at me and I think that's a lot easier to live with. And I think initially I would have loved someone to blame and point a finger at and say, you've done this to me, but... I'd done that to me, I guess, looking back. And it wasn't just the individual that, that initially hacked me. There were thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people that, that also done wrong with those videos by liking, commenting, sharing, having a chat about it with their mate. Um, I think there were a lot of people that did cause me, me heart and pain. But 
um, the individual that did do it, whoever they are, wherever they are, they could be my next door neighbour, they could be living thousands of miles away, but I don't hold any anger, certainly not anymore. Complete shock. <laughs> Uncertain how far it spread. Must have affected you very deeply. Yeah, I think until the day I die, I will have scars that will never really heal. I think I, I can give those scars TLC and really help make them look a little bit better. But deep inside, I don't think I'll ever feel the same again. And there's a lot of work that has been done and will continue to need to be done. I still have moments. Um, I still have moments where I never used to suffer with anxiety. And I went through a period of life where I lived daily with that feeling of anxiety. And I, I never understood what anxiety was. I just thought it was something that people over-dramatised. And then the moment that I felt it, I thought, oh my goodness, this is that feeling that people try to describe on TV and I, I'm living proof that, wow, I can't breathe. I thought I was having a heart attack most days of my life and I was like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, something's wrong with me, I need to phone, I need to phone the hospital. And I think quickly I was like, no, this is my emotions doing this to me. And now I still suffer with anxiety, but it's in moments. It's when I get no caller IDs. Um, I hate that. It's when I see the police. I don't know why that's a trigger, but I see the police and I... I experienced those. Um, it's in moments where I feel like I, I'm not safe. That could be walking into a new room full of people. It could be when I'm going a night out, when it's it's not familiar settings, it's not a familiar group. That's really when I'm, I experience those. But I'm really, really fortunate that I don't live daily with that pain anymore. But it certainly still comes back and it comes back hard when it does. How did you find a way out of the trauma? What helped you? How are you now? <sighs> I think... I think every time I get asked this question, I answer it completely differently. I don't know what the what the light bulb moment was. I don't actually think there was a a real light bulb moment. I do think there there was a moment that I remember vividly, um, and that was every morning I woke up and every day I went to the toilet and I went for a shower and went upstairs. We had this big open window where I lived and it was just like this field, beautiful field and I had just one huge tree that just every day caught my eye and it was torturing me because I thought that's that's a sign and I always look for signs, I always have in life. I've always been a little bit spiritual when it comes to that and I thought the sign was telling me that I need to, that that's going to be where I take my own life and I know that sounds very extreme but that's where I was at at that time and every day I looked at it, I thought like... <sighs> Come on, Lee, have the strength to go and do that. Go and go, it, it, it's there, it's waiting for you. And I remember, I don't know how, but I woke up one day and I just looking at this tree and I thought, how can, how can I change the perspective? Because you are torturing me. You are, you're killing me off because you're, it's just temptation. And I remember just thinking, I think the day before it had been raining and then this day it, it was, it was sunny. And I remember thinking, wow, that tree actually like still standing tall and it survived that rainfall and that wind and it loses leaves, but it still remains the same and it still um, stands strong and it stands alone. And I remember thinking that tree's going to be me. I'm going to still remain as being Lee and I'm still going to be alive, but I'm going to lose some branches and I'm going to lose some leaves and I'm going to have some cuts and bruises, but I'm still going to exist. I might be a little bit different, but... I think that was a moment where I, I learned about changing the narrative on things that I'm seeing and feeling. And I think the biggest thing was was the support of my friends and family. I think it's a no-brainer without their support, not just being there. I think their, their unconditional love and support, people taking days and weeks off work to come and visit me, people genuinely distraught for me. Without that... I wouldn't have got over it. And then later in the recovery, when I was over the shock and accepted that it happened, it was probably that's when I, I seeked help and I got therapy. And I, I always say my therapist kept me alive. But then I, I met a mentor, Rob, and he changed my life. He told me that not everyone cared about me. And I thought, what do you mean everyone cares about me? And that was quite hard to, to process. But what he meant was, not everyone is talking about your, your videos. Not everyone has seen them. Not everyone thinks that you are a slag, a slut, these horrible names that people would call me. He said, not everyone. And I was like, no, well, I, it is everyone. He went, well, I don't think that. I've not seen your videos. He said, that's your impression on you because all you're listening to is the negative opinions. 
not the positive opinions and not people that love you. Um, and that was really when my life started to look up and, and only a month after um, doing a podcast in 2021 with Rob, I met Matt and Fraser. Um, and I think that was the final piece of my, pu my puzzle that I was never going to be happy doing what I was still doing when the trauma happened. And when I met Matt and Fraser, I, um, I gave up my other career and I went and worked with um, these two amazing people. And I think that's really when the healing really kicked off. Um, and I'm forever grateful for that. And can I say something about the tree that she now is, if we're going to continue the tree analogy? Um, so we talked to the players about taking responsibility, but there's a big difference between responsibility and fault. Lee was a victim. It was, I don't think she believed she was a victim in the beginning. You know, I, I've caused this myself. It's my fault. Um, but what she was was res responsible for the recovery and the creeps and criminals that did this to her were never going to heal her. She had to heal herself. We've seen her, in, we've had her in front of Premier League men's first team groups. Um, Brentford was a real highlight. Um, there was a Danish defender called Zank who started clapping in the middle of her talk. It was unbelievable. It made me cry, I cry a lot. It made me cry <laughs> at this stage. It was wonderful. And one thing you like this, John, um, we, we do a lot of talk, talk, talks and Lee does a lot of work with women's groups. Um, but, but it's the WSL first team groups that really scare her because she knows those girls. Um, we did a wonderful one with Tottenham Hotspur and she knew some of the, the girls there and um, the amount of hugs she got. She didn't get any hugs after Brentford, I'd be clear on that because there are boundaries, but the amount of hugs that she got after that were wonderful. And then just this week, this has been an amazing week. We're so really proud to be here in Ireland as part of our week. We started the week, I was at Newmarket with some jockeys and then Tuesday we were at Edgebaston with a lot of young cricket players and there was a group of boys and group of girls who she totally inspired. And Lee has a lot of followers on Instagram anyway, but I think she got about 50 new followers all from young female cricket players who she's inspired. So I know I speak for me and for Fraser. She is the strongest and most brilliant young woman I've ever met, bar none. You said something very powerful to us there, Lee, and, and thank you for doing so. Uh, Fraser, you were forced to retire from football at the age of 28 because you had a heart condition. Mm, yeah, that was um, it was five years to the yeah, just gone five years to the day actually. Um, and yeah, it was it was an abrupt ending for me. Um, I was yeah, I was 28 at the time, um, and the plan was oh, I had a, an episode after a game, got rushed to hospital. Um, we'd had a big game the week before for New. I was playing for Newport, so I was in League Two. And we we got Man City in the FA Cup. It was like a big game for me and my family. And it was two days after that that I had this episode after a game. I took myself off during a game because I didn't, I didn't feel great. Taken to hospital and within the, yeah, within the space of a week of that big game against City, I was on a, on a ward in, in Wales just with these old guys with oxygen tanks on their backs and stuff. Kind of just thinking what has happened here in this week. Um, and it was probably another week of seeing specialists and having loads of tests done that it was deemed unsafe for me to carry on. And the plan then, it was, uh, it's been, a, you know, the initial struggle of retirement, um, you know, led me down a road, a road of addiction and drinking heavily. Um, but the plan then was to, you know, if you stop playing now, you probably won't need an operation. We'll just get this monitored and, you know, make some adjustments to your lifestyle, but you shouldn't need an operation. And then about a year ago, uh, it came back that it got a lot worse. So I went in for... I think it's seven, coming up seven months, six, seven months since I, I had to have open heart surgery. So I've had a, a new mechanical valve put in, my one taken out, big old operation. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back now and I'm back doing what I enjoy and feeling, feeling better than I ever have done because I was, I was really struggling before that operation. And have you been an educator around the challenges you faced when you did retire? Uh, I'd love to do way more with retiring athletes um, because I know, for me, I, I played at a lower level. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a bank account full of money and a cushion to just go, right, I don't need to work again. I, I had to get up and, and go pretty much straight away. And I met Matt through, I came through Chelsea's academy and I got straight back in at Chelsea. I said, who can you introduce me to? What can I do? And they introduced me to Matt, who was doing a, a social media session and we got talking and yeah, five years on, we've, we've got a business together. There's still way more that I'd love to do around athletes from all different sports retiring because that loss of identity, routine, structure, um, getting to the age of 30, 35 if you're lucky, um, and all the issues that come with it, no matter how prepared you think you are, I see so many that 
um, I listened to a podcast with with Jason McAteer yesterday, who was a uh, Ireland international, yes. and you know who, who talks about being being suicidal and almost almost you know taking his own life a year after retirement. And you think of these like really successful careers, and a lot of people get to that point where they they finish and they just don't know who they are or what they stand for, and go through you know the, the statistics around addiction, bankruptcy, divorce is is huge. So I'd love to do way more in that area as well. And then obviously the current athletes and the young players that we're we're educating before they've even started that journey um, is a is a huge thing for us as well. You know, we we talk to kids as young as nine, and then we also talk to first team players. So we're getting you know both ends of that spectrum, and yeah, just trying to trying to pass on what we can. So you used alcohol to fill the void to a degree. Oh yeah, that was that was my crutch. It was um, just something that gave me a bit of comfort at the time, and I drank throughout my career occasionally, like the odd. Saturday night I'd go out with my teammates or whatever but I'd never drunk at home alone and addiction takes you so it starts off very social um you know any kind of form of addiction um and it slowly wants you on its own and isolated and yeah at that point it was I felt like I needed alcohol to switch off to sleep um and it was the one time I felt a bit comfortable I felt like the voice in my head stopped a little bit but those two or three beers in an evening became four or five, six or seven. It went from a Friday and a Saturday to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and just got in that kind of dark spiral with it. Um, but yeah, thankful um, that I managed to, to get the help I needed and I'm, I'll be you know, coming up to three years, um, three years sober this summer. That's something to be commended. There was someone close to me who had challenges with PTSD and alcohol and was a negative support. It wasn't the singular issue, but the trauma caused the alcoholism to mm. a degree or the, or the negative support of his drinking. And, and the counselor said to him, just give it up for three months. Uh, and then they'd argue with him and it would be, oh, the reasons are this or that. Just give it up for three months. Uh, and the other thing he would say would be no alcohol, no risk. And it's not that we're here to say in a preaching way, you can't drink, you shouldn't mm. drink. It's about identifying that sometimes... You could be the last person to see that might be an issue. Mm. And and I do, I do uh, you know, I did a lot of talks around addiction and alcohol. And my message isn't, I'm not anti-alcohol. I'm not saying everyone should be sober. But I'm, I'm really conscious that there will be, you know, a large percentage of players in groups and in businesses as well. But there's a large percentage of any room that I'm talking to that will have, you know, a dysfunctional relationship with alcohol. If not them, then there will definitely be a, a family member that, you know, that this illness has. Um and it's trying to, I hate seeing people lose everything and hit rock bottom before they then go, right, I better make a change. It's like, can you get there when you do, you know, those early warning signs are there? Can you can you then kind of intervene and, you know, make it so that person doesn't have to lose everything in order to make a change? Some people have to go through, you know, uh, Al-Anon meetings. So if, you're, if you've got a family member that's an alcoholic or affected by alcohol, the first step of their 12-step program is we are powerless over the alcoholic. So a lot of people will say to me, you know, I, I want to try and get my husband to stop drinking or my partner or this or that. Ultimately, like, you are powerless over them. Some people have to reach a certain point of pain in order to stop. But other people can be, you know, they can be saved with the right compassionate words. And, um, you know, all I try and do is, is get a message across, not preach, just try and be like a... Someone said to me once, just be a lighthouse, just stand there and shine and spread your message. And naturally people that are curious will want to come towards that instead of me going out going, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's just stand there, say what my experience and my my hope is. And then off the back of that, if people resonate, they they then ask questions of, of me or themselves. We're speaking to ex-Scottish uh, underage international and Crystal Palace player Lee Nicholl, media lawyer Matt Hemsworth, a director of the B5 consultancy, and another B5 uh, director, Fraser Franks here, a former footballer with Stevenage and Newport County on the Saturday panel here on Off the Ball on News Talk. Social media, Matt, as a lawyer, you must have seen through all the cases you've worked with, all the, the clients you've worked with, how harmful and pernicious social media can be. Yeah, it's um, the whole reason that we set this business up in the first place. I still do that job as a lawyer, so I still find myself every now and then, my phone goes off on a Friday night and I turn to my wife and say, oh God, I think something's about to change for this weekend. Um, but the whole reason for B5 is 
I feel very, very passionate about the impact it has on the individuals involved, whether it be your bog standard kiss and tell. Some footballer's made a terrible mistake, which is about to ruin his life and his um, his home life, etc. Um, social media has brought in additional elements and additional risks. And we talk about opportunity and risk. So we do a lot of work with young players, talking to them about how they... Uh, I know this is, if you just listen to this, I know you see me holding up my phone, but I'm waving my phone around. When you are a young football player, rugby player, GAA player, whatever else, you get a blue tick, you get a lot of followings, you get interest, you make your first team debut, your followers go up. Then all of a sudden, when you're responding to messages, it might be messages with the opposite sex, it might be uh, messages with other people, um, your likes go to the top of their list, your DMs go to the top of their list. And we talk about raising the bar of who you are. So when we talk about opportunity and risk, I can't imagine what it's like to be an 18-year-old lad who's just started playing Premier League football or whatever else or just broken into playing under-20s rugby for Ireland or whatever. Um, and all of a sudden, everyone wants a bit of you. And life feels as though it's getting easy. So, hey, look at these opportunities for you. These opportunities are here. Have it, have it, have it. You can have what you like. And then you make one stupid mistake and that kind of slap around your face. No, no. How dare you behave like that? And it's almost, I feel as though we've almost got a sort of abusive society. The relationship between our young sports stars and us uh, is that classic, well, we certainly do it over here in, in England, is build them up and knock them down. So we want them to enjoy their lives and their opportunities. And, you know, Fraser talks about and talks so well about the high pressure of it. And what's really interesting, the work that Fraser does in talking about alcohol, it's not just about alcohol, it's about all those negative escapes out there. He's been doing that in cricket. Now, it's been great watching him become a cricket fan because he grew up on a council estate in Battersea. He didn't know which end of the bat you were supposed to hold. And all of a sudden, he's playing 10cc dreadlock holiday. I, I don't like cricket, I love it. He gets pulled to one side by two or three players after every session. And he then relays back to me these conversations that he has. And of course, he doesn't know who any of these cricket players are. And almost every single one of them is one that's played, that is one of the stars of the team. And I, and, I know, and I do think, obviously, we all want to be sports stars. I still do at 45. There's no way it's going to happen. We all want to be that. But the pressure that's involved is massive. And then when you've got ready access to the world, that's what social media is, ready access to the world. And people can reach out to you. And it's one thing that's probably important to say, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but... Most public figures read their DMs, not all of them, not all their DMs, particularly if you've got a huge following, but they get seen. Um, so they are very accessible. I mean, there's a complaint nowadays, all oh, football players, Premier League players are not accessible. They really are, more than they've ever been, because you can send them a message right to their doorstep. You can impact them mentally. And you know, one of the saddest parts of what I do is help track down people that send threats and racist abuse. And they almost always come through direct message on Instagram, you can get to a footballer straight away. And as I say, I almost regret saying that. I hope some idiot's not listening to this and thinks, oh, OK, well, I will send a message to that St. Pat's player or whatever else because he didn't play that well on Friday night. We're going to the game. That's why I use that as the example. So it is opportunity, but it is risk as well. And it's therefore really important for social media companies and um, authorities to be able to deal with this stuff. I really feel that social media companies uh, don't take enough responsibility for the stuff that's published online and uh, are not held accountable by governments worldwide. Well, I mean, in terms of social media companies, I've got two ways of looking at it that are opposite ends. One is I think one of our big problems is society. You know, we need more empathy in our society and we as a society need to be bringing up young boys and girls to have empathy, kindness, respect and all of that. So that's the kind of letting the social media companies off the hook. But I do have an argument that the social media companies should be doing more. And the point is, they monetize hate. They don't. They they wouldn't say that they encourage it, but when you think, I mean, I, I don't know whether you you use Twitter or X. I de I'm decreasing in my use of it because it's not an, as enjoyable place as it used to be. But the tweets that really bang, the really controversial ones, the ones that are inflammatory, the ones that annoy people, and then you'll see. This is what the culture wars are. You'll see someone who posts something pretty awful and anti-immigration, some news clip from GB News or whatever else. I'm giving away some of my sensibilities. And then the major engagement will be from people who think it's outrageous. Well, for example, I tweeted that the robe had been put on Lilo Messi at the World Cup was a disgrace. And then it went viral in the Arab world and I got death threats for it. Wow. 
So, so your main tweet that banged was the one that upset people. Yeah, very <laughs> unwittingly. I, I didn't in, in, intend to upset anybody yeah. or in any way insult anybody. I just thought that the, his moment was being stolen by this um, ritual that had no place at the presenting of the World Cup trophy. See, but I'm nervous about worldwide. agreeing with you on that tweet now because if this goes viral, <laughs> yeah. I'm in trouble. Because I'm interested in this, the dopamine aspect, isn't it, Lee, of the fact that who doesn't like a like? And if you're a young person in sport, first of all, you've got a profile, you're doing well, people are looking up to you, you could be the star of the future. Who doesn't like being given the positive affirmation of that? I mean, I don't think you're human if you don't like the, the positive feedback, the love hearts, the, as Matt says, the goat emojis, the fire emojis, you're great, you're this, you're that, you're going to be the next big thing. It's the same in real life, right? We all love being complimented, being told that we smell nice, we've got a nice smile or we look good and we've got nice clothes on. Um, but on the other hand of that and something that I just said this week to the female cricketers was if we get carried away and believe the good the good noise, what's going to happen when the, the negativity hits as well? So we can be looking at our Instagram or Twitter and thinking, oh my goodness, loads of people love me. Look at all this love and then just one comment and it's like you're coming straight back down and you're going lower than ever and the way we like to view it it's we can't believe the good new the good noise because then when the, the low noise comes and when the huge negativity hits it's going to hit really really hard so it's about just ignoring any noise the good and the bad so that you're able to cope with it while still performing with still being a a, a friend a family a partner um it's really, really important that we don't get carried away with the positive comments because when those negative comments hit, then, gosh, it's it's really, really difficult to deal with. And especially if you're suffering in your personal life with something else, that's when it becomes... that. I do believe that's when it's the start of mental health problems for those that haven't suffered yeah. prior. And it is a drug. It's mm. a, it, I think we will reflect back on the social media industry in 20 years' time and we will look at them as we look at the cigarette industry now. And when you put it in the context of athletes... Um, this will be a clip that I wouldn't want to be taken out of context, but we're all smoking dope and the athletes are taking something much harder because the validation that they get, the amount of likes and comments and compliments, but the one key thing is, and Lee was absolutely right when she said, we are all sensitive souls. I don't care what anyone says. So we, um, Fraser was on TalkSport with Martin Keown a few years ago and Martin said he used to look at the newspaper reports and if someone gave him six out of ten, he'd talk for the rest of the week. And I think Martin own is a kind of encapsulation of what you think I can see you frowning John because he was an Arsenal legend um, <laughs> but he's an encapsulation of what you think of that kind of oh you know water for ducks back I wouldn't worry about that so you know big strong cent centre half like Martin Keown it bothers him and I always like you always tell that story Fraser of you, when Fraser walked in you were seeing what big lad he is he's a big strong centre back but his mum used to stick up for him on Twitter which was the worst <laughs> that she could possibly have done did she? <laughs> Yeah, so you get to. I think one of the messages we try and get across to the to, to any kind of players that we that we speak to is, um, as Lee said, like not getting carried away with that validation that comes when it when it does come early on. Because when you break into any kind of first team, it's it's all positive and it can you know it can feel nice. But then whatever kind of level, if you play consistently, um, you'll get the negative comments and you know we we say ignore the noise and stay away from it. And I would do that myself but my mum would type my name in all the time on, on Twitter or whatever it was, or mates would do the same. So you're trying to avoid it, and then you get a friend that sends you something going, have you seen what this bloke said about you? Have you seen what this article's... And I, I'm avoiding it. But yeah, my mum would take it a step far, and um, she'd... I played for Luton, which is probably the biggest club I played for, and I didn't have a great second season there. Look at them now, Fraser. I know, yeah. <laughs> started that off for them. Um, but they, um, I, I, get, I get some stick after games. And uh, yeah, there's a few occasions where she had a little, a little bite back to, to protect her boy. Would that make you because then you want to protect her? Would that make you angry? Yeah, I was just, I was just saying, look, don't go near. Basically, warning her not to go near because you're, you're looking for something that you know you're not going to like anyway. And again, we always go back to like whose opinion really matters. If you're a player, it's family members, coaches, teammates. You've got like a circle of people around you whose whose opinion should matter. Anyone outside of that, that's why we say whether it's good, bad, indifferent, it, they try not to let that sort of infiltrate your little circle. But it can be difficult because family members, my mum loved it when I got praise or when I was given a good mark or a man of the match or I was featured positively. So again, it can become a drug for them as well. They want to see and they're proud and they want to share it with their friends. And then when it goes the other way and they, you know, they don't like it, they're still kind of looking for it a little bit. So... 
it's about trying to ignore that. And I did try and get that across to her. And I think by the time I was 28, it finally, um, the pin finally dropped. So this incident when it happened, Leah Besh, uh, your image has been posted without your consent online. The social media abuse then, was there a deluge after that? Yeah, actually, I mean, I brought myself off of social media at that time for, yes. I can't really remember how long it was. I think we're looking at maybe just two or three weeks, but I literally done everything possible. I changed my name on Instagram. I put everything on private. Like I literally came off the apps and, and logged out them because I was like, oh my goodness, I am dealing with enough in person at the minute. But relating back to what Fraser said, I was off of it, but my friends would be coming in and be like, Lee, have you seen this tweet? And oh, th this has been said. And then I was hearing my friends who didn't even use Twitter or X at that point. It was becoming unpopular to, to tweet at that point for the younger generation. I remember my friends were then posting stuff like, uh, my friend Celia, who's a professional rugby player, she had posted like, uh, please think twice before you comment on uh, what someone's done because you have no idea what they're going through. And I remember I went on to see it and I was like, oh, it made me cry because I'm like, look how much this has impacted my friends too. But my friends would come to me like, I've seen this comment and that person's put some laughing faces and then Obviously, I think when I when I went back on social media, couldn't stop writing my name into Twitter, and that was that was awful. Like it became an obsession. I was doing it all the time, and I was refreshing. And the amount of comments that I remember seeing, that if anyone had to hear the comments that impacted me most, it, it's not even that bad. But when you feel that bad inside, and you read a comment online saying, "Have you seen those Lee Nickel vid videos?" and then just click on it and see people saying or oh, where can I get them? And someone saying, I've DM'd you, or um, Lee Nichols' videos are wild. I'm like, I always say, it's like people are writing about me on Twitter as if it's an episode of Match of the Day. Yeah. Like, my life is currently at risk. My family and friends are heartbroken at the moment. I don't want to be alive, but people, and we spoke to one of the guys that actually put that tweet out, that specific tweet out, and I got to meet him via Zoom, and... He said to me, he used it like his, it's his diary. And I thought, your diary is meant to be private. That's a public profile and platform. Um, but I guess it, it does just sum up that most people don't ever mean to cause you harm. He said to me, he never thought I'd read it because I was a celebrity. And I thought, what do you mean? We're just human beings. It doesn't matter if you're a celebrity or if you have got a a normal job like we've all got feelings and especially when you're so vulnerable of course I want to see what people were saying about me but I wish I didn't go back on it but I was also dealing with the fact that I didn't have Matt at the time who could type my name in and try and get things removed blocked deleted yes. for me so I had to do all the groundwork for myself and my friends done a hell of a lot of it instead of me but of course I got myself involved in it and I was trying to track down where the videos were. I was then trying to send emails. I was trying to keep a hold of the links. I, I was like the, the glue to trying to get it all um, better and get it all going away. Now, if I had known Matt a couple of years prior or if I actually returned his phone call when he initially reached out, I wouldn't have had to see anywhere near the amount of abuse and comments and the comments on these silly blogs that we don't class as social media, but blogs are the ultimate worst because no one goes on a blog to say Lee Nichols a great human being they only go on a blog to say Fraser Franks is terrible at football yeah um, or I'm a terrible radio <laughs> presenter yeah. a lot of people have said on blogs yeah. um, but yeah. I'm not trying to um, you know be facetious you're almost talking about an objectifying of a human being here we're talking about making somebody that they're less human and actually not thinking that they're actually a human being there might be like thoughts and feelings behind the surface would you talk to males about relationships, about porn culture, about these kind of things? Yeah, I'm probably best to hand this one over <laughs> to Fraser because it is, an, it is a session that we do exactly. Yeah, we did, we did a session on Tuesday. Um, literally, entire, <laughs> relationships and porn culture is in the, in the title of the session. Um, and we think it a, it's a, has a massive impact on the way that men unhealthily view sex. And we've got, you know, there's a, a, statistic, in there using, a, a statistic I use in there, which is... Um, the average age that a child will view pornography, like hard, hardcore pornography for the first time, and the average age is 11. Shocking. Yeah, but there's, there's reports where it goes down, you know, as young as, as young as seven, and you're getting... It's really... When you actually look into it, it's, it's crazy, but you, you look into it and how they've discovered that it's, it's kids this age are using it, 
is you, you're getting young kids typing in really innocent things like boobies onto Google. And it sounds like so innocent when you think of that. And it leads them to these hardcore pornography sites. And I think if you're 11 years old and that's your first image of what sex looks like, then um, it can be a dangerous place to, you know, to, to, be, to be getting that information from. And, you know, we see, um, we see the culture within society, but we also want to change the culture within a, a dressing room and a changing room in professional sport, the way that women are spoken about, the way that there's a macho environment where lads are kind dressing of... Dressing room banter. Yeah, and, and lads are trying to one-up each other. Would you have done that yourself other. when you were younger? I, yeah, yeah, I was completely inauthentic when I was younger. I, I talk about this openly. You know, when I was 17, 18, and I got chucked into... I was at Brentford at the time in, into their first team. I'd do anything for those 35-year-old lads to accept me into the group. If that meant I needed to be last man standing on a night out or make everyone laugh or do something, then I was doing it. Um, my big regret in football is when I became a senior player, I knew what was right and wrong, but I didn't call it out enough. And I'd see things, I'd see younger players go on a night out and they might send a really inappropriate video to the WhatsApp group that I knew was wrong, that I wouldn't engage with and I wouldn't laugh at, but I also wouldn't call out and I kind of let it go a little bit. And now I'm really keen to try and change that culture. I think a lot of, a lot of these players are getting themselves into ridiculous and stupid situations that will have massive impacts on their careers and their lives just to try and impress their teammates and try and give it the big in and be Jack the Lad when, you know, it's, it's, it's not the way it should be. And I'm now a strong enough man to see that. And again, hopefully I can, you know, impact some of these some of these younger players. So the work you're doing this week with Rugby Players Ireland, uh, what are you trying to achieve? I suppose, what's the goal and using your experience in sport, uh, Matt, and, and also the experience that Lee and Fraser have as um, athletes, former athletes? I think there's a, there's a few things... We're trying to inject a little bit of hope, actually. I want to start off with a positive on that because we will we will talk a lot about some of the negative things that exist out there. We will talk about abuse, but there is a lot of hope in it. And I just wanted to touch on a few things that Lee said. Um, she mentioned that Zoom she had with a, a troll who had spoken about her and shared her videos. It's something we've done a lot of, which is when individuals have broken the law, so shared her video, we have been, we've worked with a brilliant company called Sport Radar to see if we can identify who those individuals are and we take legal action against them. Now, that is not because I'm the most prickly individual in the world and I think Lee's my daughter and I need to look after her, although sometimes that does happen. And I kind of have, we have taken her in my family as our second daughter. But we do it actually because we think it's a really important thing to do for society to show that there's consequences for these actions. They have real world harms uh, re uh, on these online actions. Um, and we want this group of young boys and girls to know that, you know, that is open to them and uh, there, there, there is action being taken. And then I flip it to that responsibility point as well. We're hoping that they will go out into the world and think about the decisions that they make. So when Fraser talks about the way that you conduct yourself in relationships, you know, you can apply that to any aspect of your life. You know, taking responsibility, raising the bar of who you are as a human being. And this is not just aimed at the boys. I want to be really clear on that. I get a little bit disloyal to our gender, doing not what I do for a living. And, and Lee's not the only person I help out with this kind of stuff. There's a reason that we work with Lee is because I'd seen this happen to a lot of my clients. It was something I was really passionate about. And I ended up becoming kind of a, a, a man-hater as a result, which is not fair at all. Um, it is aimed at all of us. And that kind of getting caught up in that opportunity versus risk, that is a really important aspect of it. And you make bad decisions. We are interested in helping them to make good decisions that benefit them because actually they benefit everyone around them. And I think that's a really, really important point. We don't get groups of young footballers in a room or rugby players in this instance and say, look, this is how you'll get away of being an absolute so-and-so. We get them in the room and say, actually, tell you what, your life is going to be a 100 times better if you go into that great world out there and you raise a bar of who you are, you treat people with respect, you're cautious, you take responsibility for your actions, and we never know how many people will influence. We'll always find out those that we didn't because they'll be back on our door and we'll be trying to put fires out for them because of the mistakes they've made. But is this real wood? I'm fingers <laughs> touching wood and doing fingers... I'm not even superstitious, but we hope to positively influence people. What is your aim out of this? You were speaking to male to female athletes that from your experience, both personally and from an experience of an athlete that you want to get across in terms of helping people and their challenges as, as sports stars of the future, potentially? I've got two main aims that every time I go into a chat that I want to leave with is, one, 
accepting the fact that as a human being, you're going to make a mistake at some point. You're going to make the wrong decision. Um, it's not about the mistake you make. It's about how you respond to that. And the, the second part of that is also you're going to receive a lot of abuse um, if you are successful, which is it's a weirdly good thing, you know, if you're getting a lot of abuse that you're doing okay. Um, but we, I love, love, I hate that I have to make them aware, but I enjoy putting examples up of people that have once sat in that seat that, that the people we're talking to have sat in and telling them you're probably going to receive this, this and this. For the girls, it's... It's not just the personal abuse as an athlete, it's the sexualised abuse, it's the prejudice that they receive as well. And it's like, this is probably what you're going to receive. It's going to make you feel like this. This is coping mechanisms and things that we would recommend to help you What are those that. things? Um, cope mechanisms or, or top top tips from a... What? Well, let's say, say if it's a female athlete getting mm -hmm. stick, that there might, there might be in an amateur sport, for example. Yeah. Um, the biggest practical top tip I've got is there's a thing called mute words or it might be, depending on what platform it is, it'll, it'll change. But on Instagram, there's a, a filter called mute words and you can imagine how long my list is on yes. Instagram. Um, so let's use a, a acceptable one. Let's say it was teeth. If I was insecure about my teeth and I knew that maybe if I play really well or bad on Sunday, someone might say Lee's teeth are awful. So I will put the word teeth into my, my filtered words and anyone that sends me any abuse on Instagram with the word teeth, I will never see. And those around me on my platform will never see. But the troll who has sent that will still see it. So the reason that I always go back to that version is when I was blocking trolls, they would probably make a new profile and come back bigger, come back nastier. But now I just mute it. They have no idea I haven't seen that. So they get the validation that they think they're abusing me. But I'm like, I'll never know how much abuse I'm getting anymore because those that filtered words and it's it, we live in a sad society that we have to do that, but we have we we've got a responsibility to take control of our of our private public space, if that makes sense. And and I'm going to defend Meta on on this. So we, and I do this because actually we end up doing a lot of work with Meta to help our our clients on stuff since. Lee started doing that. They've improved their blocking techniques and mechanisms, which means that. God forbid you sent me some awful messages, John, I block you and you've got five burner accounts just to get around it so you can carry on abusing me. Those accounts will automatically be blocked as well. So they are getting better. And I say that because I don't think X is getting much better. No. I still think Meta have got more to do, but they, they have some mechanisms in place. And for you, Fraser, what do you want to get across at this uh, meeting with the Rugby Players Ireland and, and generally as a former athlete yourself to, to the advice you'd like to give to... People think, coming through. Yeah, I think touching on that that part that, that Lee said about coping mechanisms as well, it's like when it does happen, not to try and deal with it all themselves. Like it's it's being comfortable to, you know, to to be okay with what comes, to be a little bit hurt by it and be able to, to talk to someone at your club or someone that's close to you. You know, we, we work one-to-one -one with a lot of athletes as well and it's having someone that you can actually address this with. It's not like suppressing and drinking it away, eating it away, gambling it away, whatever it is, whatever your vice is to try and get out of this. It's like actually there's a really healthy mechanism in, in just talking to someone. I'm a massive believer in that. But we want to, yeah, we want to just try and... A big thing for me is not even so much some of these athletes, how, how their careers go and who goes on to have the best international career. It's like can you create good human beings off the back of it? Can you help these guys go through their career and make as few unnecessary mistakes and risks um, as possible and just try and influence people to be, you know, to raise the bar and to, to, sh to shift that culture within a team sport? I know that it's getting better, but there's still way more that, that you know, we want to try and influence. And as I said, we want to try and help the individuals, but, but try and build that culture of having really good role models within the sport as well. Just to finish on a lighter note, uh, I believe, Lee, that, is Yakinson and Abby Larkin are under your wing? <laughs> yeah, they've just recently in the January transfer window signed for Crystal Palace and that's where I am. The player lays on there for the women's team. So I've had the, the absolute joy of driving them everywhere before <laughs> Abby just got her, new, her first ever car a couple of weeks ago. So that was a lovely moment. But gosh, they're both very, very loud. Do they, they talk are... about the World Cup and uh, the Irish team and how things yeah, are going and they... everything? 
they talk really, really fondly of the Irish team in general. When you mention Ireland, camp, next fixtures, World Cup, you can see every single teeth. We have in England. Their mouth. I know you're Scottish, but we have England this year as well. In the yeah, I was I, I was talking to Izzy about it last night. We were talking about the group. It's a, it's a really tough group, but I guess as a as an Irish international or me being Scottish, a Scottish international. If if I'm if I'm Izzy or Abbey, you're you're delighted. You're playing on a big stage against some of the world. In fact, the world's best players. It's going to be tough, but. I don't think you can ever compete with the heart of the Irish or the Scottish. Um, I think it, yeah, we were looking at past results and I think they hadn't played England since, gosh, was it 2014? That was the last friendly they played against them and only lost one now, um, I think, if I've got that right. But we're look, doing some research and, of course, the girls are excited. They are, they are currently absolutely living their dream. And yeah, because Katie McCabe is now playing our star player in front of 60,000 people at Arsenal. Weekly. And the, the, the growth of the Women's Super League. So for Izzy, for Abby, it's really exciting uh, to become something in the next 10 years that this can be a really good career. Yeah, I think both of them are at an excellent age to come into, and I guess who wasn't Micah Richards that says burst onto the scene. I think they're they're coming in at a great stage of um, women's football and women's sport in general. And they're great characters as well. And I think that goes a long way. If you're a great character, you you're bubbly, you're lively and you work hard and you play with your heart and your sleeve every week. I think they'll go on to be very successful human beings, whether that does or doesn't include football, I guess. I'm not too fussed about that, but they're just, they're great people and their family should be, and Ireland should be really proud of them. Well said. And you played a part of Garmin at Newport? I did play a part, yeah, and I've seen he's, um, he's at Waterford now and I think he's top scorer in the league. Um He's had yeah he's had a, he's had a great career and he was the year but the year that I retired when we um, got to the FA Cup last sixteen he was, I think he finished top scorer in the FA Cup that year he scored against all the big teams he scored against Tottenham Leicester he scored our goal against Man City and yeah it's good it's good to see him back home and and uh, leading the leading the scoring charts Matt Hemsworth thank you for all the great work you're doing well it's a real pleasure and thank you for hosting us and also Lee Nickel former Crystal Palace footballer and former Newport and Stevenage footballer Fraser Franks. Thank you so much for your time and giving your insight and giving your stories today for us. Keep up the really important and good work here. Thank you. No, thank Cheers, you so much.